All right. Um, welcome back. This will be your elimination for lecture. This will cover urinary and bowel eliminations um, and the issues that arrive with this. Here are your objectives. These are the standards for your bowel and urinary elimination. So they um, cover the definition, the types, um, assessment, um, abnormal problems, and then um, how to prevent them. So we'll go through all of these um, throughout. I would be familiar with these objectives prior to your exam. So first we're gonna start with urinary elimination. So this usually involves the kidneys, the ureters that go all the way down to the bladder, and then you have your internal sphincter, external sphincter, and then exit through the urethra. Now, also the kidneys, um, depend on supply from the renal artery. So you'll see issues in each part of this process. Okay, so normal formation and excretion of urine um, happens through glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and then tubular secretion. So those nephrons um, depend on the blood flow from the renal artery. They will cycle through about one liter of blood per minute. So these um, are definitely heavily relying on that blood flow. The Bowman's capsule is the specific part of the kidney that um, most of this filtration occurs in. So it goes from the Bowman's capsule to the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, and then the distal tubule. So this is where filtration of water, electrolytes, and waste occurs. And then reabsorption of those, um, which are controlled by the hormones. So it may be more water and electrolytes are back in or wasted. Um, depends on these hormones. So your aldosterone, your antidiuretic hormone, your parathyroid hormone, renin, and then atrial natriuretic factor. And then what happens is the secretion of the waste becomes the urine, um, is moved to the renal pelvis, the ureter, and then the bladder. Bladder can hold approximately 300 to 500 milliliters before that pressure sends a signal up to the brain um, telling the bladder that it needs to urinate. The nerve signals then um, relax the internal sphincter and cause the bladder wall to contract. And the external sphincter is then stimulated by the person. It is under the person's control. Um, and sometimes this is what determines incontinence. Um, sometimes the, everything else can go fine, but if that external sphincter is not under control, then of course there is going to be a loss of um, continence. So you'll see in the next few slides, an issue with each one of the um, areas from either the supply of blood, the filtration, the um, reabsorption, the physical um, process of getting down to the bladder um, or the neuro. Okay, so the first type of abnormal urinary problem we're gonna talk about is, of course, urinary incontinence. This is the involuntary release of urine related to the dysfunction of the external and or internal urinary symptoms. So this can be affected by depression, anxiety, cognitive impairments, and acute injury, especially to the spinal cord or surgical procedures in the near area. Um, stress incontinence, so the rest of these are types of urinary incontinence. So it's going to um, talk about what triggers it and then the amount. So pay attention to the differences of these. So stress incontinence is um, when uh, it, there's a leakage with a stressor that occurs, so like coughing or laughing. Urge incontinence is a large amount and it's usually at unexpected times, like during sleep. It is not when they would have wanted to go to the restroom. Um, overactive bladder incontinence um, is frequency and urgency. Um, so they may or may not also have urge incontinence. Um, so they're um, having that signal too frequent that they feel as though their bladder is full and needs to um, empty more frequently than they really should be, um, or the average person is. And so that, um, overactive bladder is that nerve um, being nerve signal being sent too frequently when the bladder is not fully. Functional incontinence um, is untimely incontinence. So 
so loss of urine due to the physical disability, external obstacles, or cognitive problems preventing them from reaching the toilet. So this could be someone that um, it uses the walker, doesn't quite get to the restroom in time, and has functional incontinence loss of urine on themselves. Or it could be a bedridden person that um, after so long they can't hold it anymore and they just function and cannot hold it anymore. So that is the functional incontinence. Overflow incontinence is leakage of this small amount due to full bladder. So their external sphincter is still in control and they are trying to hold back the dam. But the dam is pretty full because the bladder is full and that pressure is um, pressing on all of those and depending on that external sphincter. And so that small amount of leakage may occur with overflow incontinence. A mixed incontinence um, can be a mixture of stress and urge incontinence. So they might have a stressor um, that makes them feel like they need um, that they actually lose the entire contents of their bladder instead of a small amount. Okay. Transient incontinence is um, leakage that's temporary because of a situation, such as with an infection or a medication. Um, so this is common, like when clients who have a UTI, um, they may be easily um, more likely to urinate accidentally on themselves um, and not have much control of holding the bladder um, with an infection. And sometimes medications can do that as well, um, interfere with that neural um, signal. Okay, the next type of urinary problem is going to be urinary retention. So this is either incomplete emptying of the bladder or the complete inability to urinate. So um, whether amount, how much the amount that has come out does not matter. It is more of the leftover urine in the bladder, which can lead to problems. Um, so usually associated with obstruction, like a kidney stone, inflammation, such as an infection, or an ineffective neuromuscular activation within the bladder. So an obstruction could be also stool pressing against the bladder from the GI tract through the abdominal wall um, and can compress the bladder from fully um, emptying. Or prolapse that, tra that traps the urine in large prostate, or an external sphincter does not fully relax. Um, medications such as antidepressants, anticholinergics, and antihistamines, and as well anesthetics, um, such as when someone goes to surgery, they might lose their ability um, to fully empty their bladder um, with anesthesia. <clears throat> also, the use of a catheter, this is typically done during procedures, such as anesthetic. Um, anesthesia procedures. Um, so if they recently had a catheter, the sphincters may not be able to fully um, close um, or open um, and that neural signal may be confused, um, especially in the short period of time after a catheter has been used in that area. Psychosocial factors such as fear or anxiety um, can cause someone to not feel the, um, not empty their bladder completely, as well as discomfort due to infection or retention. So the discomfort of all of um, the infectious process, um, or even just retention in general, can lead to more re retention because of this discomfort. So like when someone has an UTI, it may be um, painful for them to urinate. And so then they only urinate enough to fulfill that urge um, and don't completely empty their bladder because it's painful. And so then they stop it um, sooner than uh, completely emptying the bladder. So these are common. Other abnormal urination patterns are the following. So these deal with the amount of urine that is coming out. So anuria, so A as in None. Um, so this is the failure of the kidneys to excrete urine, resulting from a limited blood flow to the kidneys. This is diagnosed when catheterization, so a fully catheter is inserted into the bladder and reveals that no urine is in the bladder because this rules out retention. 
So if someone's not urinated for a long period of time, you have to rule out retention, of course. You could do um, a bladder ultrasound that we'll talk about later um, to make sure that there's no, no urine in the bladder, um, as well as physically inserting a catheter to ensure that there is no urine in the bladder. So in this case, this means that they are going to need an artificial way of filtering out that waste. So that will lead us to dialysis that we'll talk about later. So that's the most important and most um, likely for complications in those cases is for anorrhea. Now these other ones um, may be early warning signs of other issues, but anorrhea is when it's really a problem and needs an intervention before the patient dies of waste overload. We'll get into later. So oliguria is a reduced urine volume of less than 400 milliliters of urine in a day. So that's not a lot, but um, so that is reduced. Polyuria is excessive. So there's more than 2.5 liters of urine in a day. Sometimes this could be from diabetes or diabetes insipidus, um, uh, improper balances of hormones. There's different things that explain to the issue here for polyuria, but just remember these numbers. <clears throat> Nocturia, so that's urination at night that disrupts the sleep cycle. So this is common with um, males with prostate issues, um, which we'll get into later. Um, dysuria is painful urination, as in with like the UTI. So that's painful, dysuria. And then hematuria means that there's red blood cells in the urine, so blood. So this could be from an inflammatory process, an infection process, um, <clears throat> any kind of thing that could be um, causing the red blood cells to be present in the urine, because that should be filtered out in the kidney. So usually this means that there's some sort of irritation, inflammation, infection going on below or inside the kidney. <clears throat> okay, so risk factors for altered urinary elimination include heart failure and shock um, can reduce blood flow to the kidneys, thereby reducing efficiency of urine production. So again, remember we talked about the kidney produce uh, filters about a liter per minute of blood. And so if there's reduced blood flow, of course, we're going to have reduced urine production. <clears throat> Children younger than three years old, um, elderly adults, pregnant women, and postmenopausal women are also at an increased risk for altered urinary eliminations. Incontinence occur frequently in females due to age as the pelvic floor muscles weaken. Retention and increased frequency occur um, frequently in males due to age, um, usually for hyperplasia of the prostate. Diuretics can lead to involuntary loss of urine in both males and females, as we have seen, as well as um, neurologic impairment, altered mobility, cognitive impairment, immunologic impairment, or infection, urinary calculi, or congenital defects. So again, that's physical problems, neurological problems, or again, obstruction, which we had talked about previously. Um, trauma to the brain, of course, that um, signal from being sent correctly. Uh, CVA, which is um, a stroke, a cardiovascular accident. Diabetic neuropathy, um, dementia, AIDS, or any other autoimmune disease can also interfere with the message being traveled and um, or never being received. Consequences of altered urinary elimination include renal failure. Um, so this is an acute kidney injury, AKI, or chronic kidney disease, CKD. And that's going to be determined um, by what's causing the failure, how um, long it's been going on, and the presence of what's going on with the lab work, um, of how really far this is damaged to the kidney. Um, incontinence, of course, can lead to skin breakdown and falls. So those can be very detrimental to um, a client, can uh, interfere with their social, their lifestyle, and relationship issues, and can lead to depression and withdrawal. If you're constantly losing your um, bladder control out in public, you're not going to stay inside. You're going to smell. You're going to be depressed. 
and you're going to lose that social interaction that most people at some point need a little bit, even if you're an introvert. Okay. Um, so it's not just the physical stuff of the skin breakdown and falls, but can lead to a depression and withdrawal. Retention. Um, if we retain urine, that can cause pain, um, like we've talked about already. Chronic bladder infections, because that urine, there's always a little bit of stasis there, and any kind of time that there is stasis um, can always lead to infection. And so if there's always a little bit of urine left in the bladder, then that's going to lead to more likelihood of infection. And then therefore, also with your pretension, you're going to get bladder distension, which is going to be very painful and can cause also, again, like we said, the cycle of further retention because of the pain to release it. Then this distension can um, lead to urinary reflux. And so the urine is actually backing up into the urine, uh, into the um, renal pelvis, uh, which creates a dilation in the ureters and the renal pelvis to accommodate that backflow of urine. And then that backflow of urine, because it's always supposed to be going out, now it's going up um, and sitting there in stasis, there you can get infection and it's infection in the kidney is called pyelonephritis and then renal atrophy. So it actually will start to shut down. Um, and then you have complete loss which can lead to inability to remove the toxins, metabolic waste, um, which can lead to fluid and electrolyte and acid base imbalances, and can lead to death if there is not an intervention here. Um, this is when that complete loss we talked about with those signs such as anuria and early signs of oliguria. Um, we need to be looking at their um, kidney functions, their lab tests, and things like that, which we'll get into in a moment, um, and intervening as soon as possible um, so that we prevent death by trying to artificially filter out all of these wastes um, because they don't need to stay in the body. That's why they're waste. Um, Buildup of those wastes need to be taken out of them. Okay, so physical exam findings for altered urinary elimination include asking the client certain questions about their pattern of how when they go, um, their frequency, how often they go, the appearance of their urine, what it looks like, and any symptoms they might have, including symptoms that may be not just pain, but also odor. So we need to inspect always inspect first. We're going to inspect the abdomen for any bladder distension um, and inspect the genitalia for redness, lesions, or discharge. And that discharge can, of course, indicate infection. Now, typically, next, we would auscultate. There's nothing really to auscultate for a urinary assessment. So then we'll move on to palpation. So we will palpate over their urinary bladder, um, looking for distension or retention of urine. Um, then we can percuss over the costovertebral angle um, where the kidneys lie and any pain that the patient reports at that point is associated with a kidney infection like that pyelonephritis that we talked about. And then we need to inspect the client's urine when given the chance. We need to note the color, the clarity, so how clear it looks at the odor and the amount of urine. So when we get the urine analysis, um, we can either ask, of, of course, the client to void for us in a specimen cup. We can perform a straight cath. So that's um, a temporary catheter that goes like a Foley, but it only goes in long enough to drain a sample and then comes out or from the tubing of an indwelling catheter, like a Foley catheter. So you would clamp off the tubing of the bag of the um, catheter and remove it from the port nearest the catheter that is inside the bladder. We are not collecting a sample from the bag. That is again stasis of urine and is um, continually being removed from there. That bag is not cleaned throughout the entire process of that, what's going on. The urine, the only type of urine that is sterile in that sense is going to be immediately coming out of the bladder. So the closest to the patient, which is in the tubing, not 
the bag. Okay, you'll find these findings in your used um, textbook, Table 34-7 on page 780. Um, at least it was on my version. I did not check to see what version it was. So normal urinalysis, here the color is going to be light yellow to amber. The clarity is going to be clear to slightly hazy. Your specific gravity is going to be 1.005 to 1.030. Your pH is going to be 4.6 to 8.0. Of course, urine is usually more acidic. That's why this is so much lower of a range. But of course, we can go up to a regular range of pH that the rest of the body is in, um, so close to 8.0. Usually we want it as acidic as possible, meaning that there is less likelihood for an infection in most cases. Protein, of course, we want um, a little protein in the urine as possible. When there's protein in the urine, it's usually an indication of kidney breakdown, um, kidney dysfunction, so we do not want to see much protein, but we will allow up to eight milligrams per deciliter. Glucose, we do not want to see in the urine. That's usually indicative of um, diabetes. Ketones, we do not want in the urine as well. This can be indicative of um, prolonged hyperglycemia that you'll see in like diabetes insipidus and um, HHNS. Um, which we talk about a little bit in pharmacology class and treating those, um, but you'll see ketones in the urine in those um, situations that there are, again, kidney breakdown due to organ dysfunction, but usually is a secondary, um, not primary kidney dysfunction as in the protein. Red blood cells, you want less than or equal to two. Um, usually you should not see much blood in the urine. Bilirubin, there should not be any bilirubin in the urine. If there is, that's usually indicative of a liver disorder. Um, sedimentation, we should not have any sediment, any crystals in the urine. Um, and of course, we should not have bacteria, yeast, or parasites in the urine. Okay, these abnormal findings you see on the right side. Um, are of course going to be the differences that you're looking for and what they indicate. Again, refer back to that table um, in your used textbook um, for what it means for the blue-green urine. The um, dark yellow urine is going to be your concentrated urine. Your light straw pale yellow urine is going to be your diluted urine. Orange urine is usually due to um, like those medications we talked about in pharmacology. Oh, and that blue-green urine, sorry, I didn't actually state it, is um, usually due to a pseudomonas infection. Clarity can be cloudy in cases of um, infection. Specific gravity increased or decreased, that's gonna determine the hydration status. Um, pH, of course, can be altered, protein, and all the rest I've already talked about in those cases of lipopenia. So again, look at that um, table for indications of these issues. Additional diagnostic tests um, are going to be renal function tests. So we're going to look at their blood um, concentration of their BUN, creatinine, and creatinine clearance. There, we're going to probably do a culture and sensitivity. So this needs to be a clean catch. This is not just a normal urine test specimen that they just pee in a cup. So this means that we're cleaning from front to back before they pee into the cup. Um, it needs to be midstream. So the first amount of urine that comes out is usually slightly contaminated with the area that it's coming out of. So that first bit of urine does not need to be caught. Um, we want actual urine from the bladder that was processed by the kidneys, not stasis urine that or picking up any kind of dirt on its way out. Um, and we need to use a sterile specimen cup. So it is, um, you cannot just collect a regular specimen and then run a culture on it because it could be um, skewed results. We could do a biopsy on the kidney to see if it's an issue with the um, nephrons, if it was an issue with the filtration 
of the kidneys or um, do a cystoscopy or uroscopy to um, go up with a scope and look for any lesions or obstructions of what um, and see exactly what's going on. We could do bladder stress testing. So um, putting stress on the bladder and seeing um, if it's an issue with neural signal or the internal sphincter. We can do urofluorometry um, and other urine flow studies. Um, we can do post void residual measurements. So we ask the client to void and then we will perform a bladder scan um, or post void catheterization to see what residual amount of urine is being left in the bladder after the client has tried to fully eliminate everything in their bladder to see what is being retained. Prevention. Um, we can, so primary prevention versus secondary prevention. Primary prevention is what the patient can do or what we can encourage the patient to do. So we're going to encourage them to hydrate, maintain regular toileting practicing practices. Um, of course, Kegel exercises is always what you hear for urinary elimination, um, preventing UTI occurrences. So these specifically can have shown in studies that um, increase the occurrence of UTIs. So avoid tight-fitting clothes that um, irritate the urethra and prevents ventilation of the perineal area. Drink at least eight ounces of water per day. So this flushes out the urinary tract. They can urinate when the urge occurs because holding it in can lead to infection. Again, that's stasis. Wiping front to back after each void or bowel movement. Even if they did not pee, they should wipe front to back. Genital area should be cleaned before sex, and then they should urinate after sex, and then, of course, clean again front to back. Showers, um, not baths, open bubble baths, soaps, powders, and sprays in the perineal area. This can cause inflammation and encourage bacterial growth. Now, secondary prevention is going to be what we can do to more of screening. So we can do a prostate scan, prostate cancer screening, um, or some of those diagnostic tests, which would be more of testing because something has already caused an issue that we believe that there's an issue, whereas secondary prevention is trying to catch it before there's an issue. So usually when we get to the point of biopsy, we've already noted some kind of abnormalities, so it's not really prevention. So really the only secondary prevention here is going to be that prostate cancer screening because there's nothing really that has set us off to believe that there is already something wrong. Okay, medications for an altered urinary elimination can include antibiotics, of course, to treat any present infection, like UTIs, diuretics to promote excretion um, and require monitoring of the, their client's electrolytes, antispasmodics um, to control the spasms and urges to urinate um, more frequently. Um, we use anticholinergics to help with the spasms. Um, and of course, analgesics for pain associated with kidney stones, cystitis, which is um, infection of the bladder, UTI, urinary tract infection, and then bladder spasms, which can be painful. Incontinence management. Okay, so when we're having to retrain a client's bladder, so this is usually that they've gone through a significant injury or they've had prolonged uh, use of a Foley catheter, and they're trying to relearn how to use their bladder and those sphincters again. So we need to provide regular toileting schedule. So that means that they're going every two hours, kind of like potty training a toddler again, okay? We're going to manage their fluid intake um, so that it's not overly much, so that they're not having to go more frequently than that. We want them to still be able to go at the intervals that we need them to go and not have that stress or urge um, prior to that. Modifying the environment, so like bringing the bed pan or the bedside commode closer to them. And we can, over time, move it to the restroom, to their bathroom. This is like for clients at home, education that we would give to client families. So at first, we might need the bedside mode at the bedside. And then as we're able to 
get on that routine, we can move it further and further and train them to hold it longer and longer to make it to the bathroom so they don't have that functional loss of incontinence before they can make it to the bathroom. Sometimes just modifying the environment is all that they need to retrain that bladder, at least for a short period of time. Um, avoiding indwelling catheters, of course. Again, irritate with those sphincters um, and can confuse the neural signals. Um, providing high quality skin care and assessment is going to be very important. So every time that they um, are going to the restroom, we need to make sure that area is staying nice and clean and dry, it does not need to be moist. Um, of course, urine is acidic, like we talked about, and can be very irritating to the skin. Um, and so we don't want it to cause any breakdown. Any breakdown can cause pain and then really um, lead again to retention because they don't want to get up and wipe because it hurts to wipe. And so there's a lot of stuff involved. So keeping their skin care um, is very important in this process. And, and of course, avoiding any medications that contribute to, to um, the incontinence in the first place, um, if possible, we change those. Now, toileting assistance needs to be timed and prompt on that schedule, like I have said again. Now, we can use the bedpan, the urinal, and bedside commode, but they also need to have clothes. If you're standing next to them, they're not gonna wanna go to the restroom. There's that other kind of um, incontinence that we talked about, about being stressed and not wanting to go to the restroom because they may not fully empty out their bladder like we need them to. So you may need to step away and then come back again. And that's important for family members as well. It can be kind of um, scary to leave someone alone because of course you want to make sure that they're not going to fall, especially if they do urinate, but you've got them to the bedside community. They are sitting there. They can call you, give them some privacy, and then come back and check on them. And um, they're more likely to get on this routine and feel more independent again. Because remember, this can cause a loss of independence and depression and withdrawal. So if they feel that privacy, they feel like a person again. Okay? That's my little tidbit. Now, personal absorbent pads or bed protecting pads, of course, we can use to catch episodes of incontinence that are in between the schedule. And of course, using that moisture barrier cream to prevent that breakdown or heal any affected areas, again, due to that urine um, being acidic and irritating the skin. Now, procedures for alternate urinary elimination. Now, procedure, of course, depends on what kind of thing is going on. We've talked about a lot of different problems. So, we talked about with chronic or acute renal failure, so in those cases, anorrhea, um, there is no filtration going on. So, they need that filtration and that waste to come out of their body. So that we're going to have to do that um, artificial filtration, which is dialysis. Now, hemodialysis versus um, peritoneal dialysis and all of that is going to be determined by the severity and with the doctor and the patient's ability to um, keep up with their appointments or being able to physically do it at home or a family member be able to do it at home. There's a lot of factors. So the main thing is that the kidney's not functioning, so we need to filter it for them, okay? Another procedure um, is going to be um, due to urinary retention. Retention, we can insert a catheter or perform a surgical treatment of the obstruction or that may be causing the retention or insert a stent. So if the retention is due to um, the ureter spasming, or um, it is not big enough to pass everything that it needs to, and so it's being held in the renal pelvis or whatever is being held out, they can go in with the cystoscope and um, place a renal or ureter stent in whatever process of the tract that is too thin for anything to pass through anymore as effective as it's supposed to, um, they can put a stent in there to hold that area open and then um, urine can completely flip out. So of course, when we insert a urinary catheter, we need to use aseptic technique. Um, routine catheter care needs to be done 
once or twice daily um, with soap and water. Soap and water, soap and water. No Provodon iodine ointments or creams are going to be really effective in the actual area that it is touching um, according to studies. Now, some facilities still like to put a barrier cream to prevent breakdown of the um, the catheter coming on the genitalia um, or along the edge of the leg. But if you have enough slack in there, it really should be able to move around and not cause that um, skin breakdown. So adding stuff in the area can actually promote uh, pH imbalances, can lead to yeast infection and things like that. So what's going to be important is keeping it clean with soap and water as often as possible, once or twice daily, and then you won't have to use these other ish things that can lead to other issues. Okay, The catheter bag, your, the urinary collection bag needs to be kept low the level of the bladder to prevent that backflow of urine. Remember the backflow can lead to an infection. So specifically this is a catheter associated urinary tract infection and then these are very important and <laughs> be um, very closely monitored at hospitals. Um, we can get dinged by um, the CMS um, for our any kind of increase or even one episode of Cotty being present um, in the hospital. Now, instead of an indwelling urinary catheter, there are condom catheters. These are less likely to lead to bacteria, so bacteria in the urine, or UTI, and therefore death. Um, and they are less painful and comfortable according to the client. But they do come with the risk of skin necrosis, penile strangulation, urethrocnitosis um, fistulas, and I spelled that wrong, um, dermatitis, skin erosion, pain, and a localized infection. So condom catheter is exactly what it sounds like. So it goes over the male's penis um, and stays in place just like a condom, um, but at the very tip um, as the tube that goes to a catheter collection bag. Now, um, these need to be replaced daily um, and assess for complications and cleaning the perineal area, of course, with soap and water when the catheter is off. Now, if the client is uncircumcised, you have to pull back the full foreskin, clean that area underneath the foreskin, rinse and dry completely before you replace the foreskin, and then you can replace the condom catheter. Okay, now if the client has a renal calculi, so a kidney stone, we can do a lithotripsy. So that's a um, procedure where they go in with ultrasound to kind of break up the kidney stone. Um, endourologic procedures or open procedures where they physically go in and um, remove the stone wherever it might be. If it's in the kidney, if it's in the ureter, or if it's in the um, bladder. Renal cancer that we can perform a nephrectomy um, to get rid of the cancer really is the only way before, especially before it spreads, is to get rid of the kidney. So that is removal of the kidney. If there's an enlarged prostate, we can um, perform a transurethral resection of the prostate. So this is called a TERP. Um, and so usually this TERP requires that continuous bladder irrigation. We talked about it a little bit in the um, pharmacology class. Um, so they go and shave off a portion of the prostate that is causing the obstruction. And so hopefully a smaller prostate you will be able to urinate more effectively, um, not causing that um, obstruction and pressure on their urethra. Otherwise, they will have to perform a prostatectomy, so that's complete removal of the prostate. If there's a prolapsed bladder or bladder cancer, we may do a cystectomy, so that is um, removal of the bladder. 
for transurethral resection, so um, removing a portion of the urethra, or they may perform laser surgery to kind of tack up that bladder. If there's bladder cancer, neurogenic bladder or trauma, they may they can also do a urinary diversion. So then they um, instead of coming out their urethra, it will come out through the stoma. So it is diverted to the abdominal wall, and they will pee into a bag that is on their abdomen. Um, you'll see these um, similar to these when we talk about colostomies in the bowel section. So um, the suprapubic catheter is where it is um, coming out of the, from the bladder is being redirected to the wall of the abdominal cavity. Um, so it's usually uh, near the umbilical button. Uh, I'm not really sure how to say that. Um, but uh, it requires daily cleansing around the site with soap and water, avoiding creams or lotions around the site, and assess for any seepage or signs of infection, of course, and document the site's appearance. Um, so you're going to pay attention to the site, of course. Um, will usually have the catheter always in place or that they will insert it a um, certain amount of times in a day if they have a pouch inside to um, drain it. So this depends on the type of diversion that they received, what kind of procedure they got. Um, but just knowing how to clean and make sure that site is not inflamed or any signs of infection. Okay. Now we move on to bowel elimination problems. So this is going to involve the um, GI tract and then of course the your large and small intestines. So normal formation of and excretion of bowels um, occurs from digestion and then absorption. So the large intestine, which includes the cecum, which is your appendix your colon, your rectum, and an anus. Um, your large intestine, so all four parts of those absorb water and electrolytes. Um, so in the case of excessive peristalsis, so your gut is moving faster, if it's moving faster, less water is being absorbed, and so then it is more watery, and therefore you have a loose stool. Opposite is also true. So reduced peristalsis, so it's moving through the gut slower, so then more water is being absorbed, so then you get a harder stool. So it's not just hydration status. Peristalsis plays a major role in the formation of stool. Okay, there's mucus in the intestine that helps lubricate and aid in the expulsion of the stool. So you need that good amount of mucus. And if there's overproduction of mucus or not enough mucus, of course, there's issues with expelling the stool from the rectum. Waste formation occurs in the colon. So once it gets to the colon, that's when it is collecting all that is remaining and is considered waste at that point. And there's no more um, reabsorption that's occurring. The stool then reaches the rectum. Pressure on the uh, rectum stimulates the urge and the muscles stretch in response and you have a so again issues with any of these can cause an issue or an abnormality of your bowel excretions now bowel incontinence incontinence again being the involuntary release of bowel then so it is the involuntary passage of your stool so this is the occasional leakage of stool while passing gas. So you meant to pass gas, but you actually had an incident. So complete leads to complete loss of bowel control. So it can be anywhere in between. So even that little bit to complete loss is considered incontinence. So this can occur when um, a client is having an episode of diarrhea, especially if there's cramping. So the cramping feels as though that they have some gas that they might need to relieve and they let it out, but because of the loose stool, the loose stool comes out as well. It can also occur in a loss of sphincter control due to traumatic injury. 
uh, pathologic change to the rectum or neurologic injury. So there's not that signal being turned on. And then of course, change and or loss of position. So if the patient is not aware, they are not gonna be able to control that external sphincter. And when they can't control it, it will, of course, enough pressure will press it out and force it out. Um, or if there's not forcing it out, um, and they're not having regular bowel movements, it can lead to constipation and infection, which we'll get into. So bowel retention is the inability to pass stool successfully from the rectum. So this is, uh, occurs when the urge to eliminate bowels is ignored and the stool becomes difficult to eliminate. So this can be due to a side effect of medications such as narcotics for that um, peristalsis um, everything is slowed down, so it can result in constipation, so that's a hard dry stool. Um, ongoing retention can lead to a loss of appetite, discomfort, and potentially fecal infection. So we'll get to that, but signs of retention are going to be those loss of appetite, discomfort, and then physical sign we're going to see fecal infection. So, of course, um, other abnormal bowel patterns, diarrhea is the loose stool, constipation is dry and hard, and then impaction. So, impaction is a hard stool in the rectum or colon that's unable to expel and becomes wedged into the bowel. And so, this is like a step up from constipation. So, this can happen in clients that are debilitated, fused, or unconscious. Um, usually, in most cases, one of the symptoms that the clients may have is oozing of liquid stool. And that's because the firm stool that is wedged in the bowel that cannot move, the stool above it is still trying to expel the waste of bowel, of stool. And so it's in its liquid form, trying to get around the stuck wedged stool and therefore leaks out. So, um, and then because, so it's not just a little bit of diarrhea, it's a little bit of loose stool and then no normal stool ever comes or an actual movement ever actually comes. And so that's when our first indication that they might have an infection. Then of course we see that loss of appetite, nausea and vomiting. They may have abdominal distension and cramping and rectal pain, especially if they try to bear down to pass it, it is wedged, it is stuck, and it's not really going to come out. So it's, again, like the next level of constipation. Impaction requires a digital rectal examination, a DRE, and removal of the impacted stool. That is exactly what it sounds like. The nurse puts on gloves, gets lubricant on your finger, and goes in goes around the edges and slowly goes in and in and in until it is able to pass out. And they have a bowel magnet right in front of you. So it is of course not the most fun thing to do as a nurse, but the relief <laughs> that the client has afterwards, they are very thankful. So risk factors for all elimination. The highest risk clients are going to be those with the cognitive impairment, so they don't get that neural signal. Um, if they've been exposed to radiation, so there's a breakdown in, again, that neural um, signal. Or multiple medications consuming excessive caffeine, which can lead to um, uh, dehydration, constipation, or limited toilet access due to immobility and social factors, which we've talked about also with um, urinary problems. So acute neurologic injury or progressive neurologic changes associated with age in both males and females can occur um, and cause this as well. Uh, clients with a stroke, so cardiovascular incident, accident, um, spinal cord injury, of course, so that signal's not being sent down, diabetic neuropathy, dementia, AIDS, or any other immune disease. The same thing as with uh, elimination problems. There's a physical defect in the system of any part of the, the system of uh, the intestines of uh, being able to get 
uh, food in. So if they can't eat, then of course they're not going to be passing any waste of stool. Um, so the whole process, not just the large intestines, any problems with the system can lead to altered bowel elimination. Of course, excessive use of laxatives, of course, is going to cause prolonged diarrhea, um, lack of fiber, fluids, and exercise um, can lead to constipation, um, diuretics, narcotics, any presents or anxiolytics, so for in anxiety, um, or patients that are pregnant can have altered bowel elimination problems. So physical exam findings for um, bowel, you're of course going to ask those assessment questions about their pattern, how often they, they go, if they have any pain, what's their diet like, what is the quality of their stool. So that one's a little tricky sometimes of how to ask that, that they're just like, oh, it's normal. Well, I need to know what is your normal. Is your normal hard and dry, or is it full and firm, or is it loose, or is it four times a day? What is your normal? Um, so then after you ask those questions, and get to know more about the patient than they might need, want you to know. You have to ask those questions so you know their normal pattern or if it's skewed from their normal. Um, then we move on to an inspection. So we're going to inspect the perianal area for redness or lesions, presence of hemorrhoids, or an anal fistula. Um, we're going to inspect the abdomen also for distension. Next, we move on to auscultation. We're going to auscultate all four bowel sounds. Um, all four quadrants for bowel sounds, as Ms. Ryber showed you in that um, presentation. Um, absence, of course, it will be associated with paralytic ileus. Paralytic as in it's not moving, so therefore you wouldn't have bowel sounds. Hyperactive bowel sounds are associated with GI inflammation or obstruction. So GI inflammation could be C. diff um, or obstruction could be bowel obstruction. Um, so usually the obstruction above the obstruction is going to be hyperactive because it's all back loop, backed up. Okay. Palpation then is next. Um, we're going to palpate the abdomen for any masses or lesions and then we're going to palpate the rectum for lesions, masses, or impacted stool. Next is percussion and this is going to identify any masses or um, excessive intestinal gas. This one is a little hard for anyone not really trained to do this. Usually you'll see this more being performed by the physicians, but it is something that is in our scope of practice to do. Okay, so next we move on to our diagnostic tests. Um, the first thing we might want to consider, especially in children, is going to be an ultrasound as it does not produce radiation to the client. Um, so this can kind of give us uh, an idea of what's going on. We can see solid objects as well as fluid. Um, and so we can kind of get a, a, a general idea of what's going on. X-ray can show um, structural abnormalities uh, as well as constipation. That hard um, Dry stool can be seen on x-ray. CT and MRI, of course, for structure problems. Upper and lower GI series to see if everything is being absorbed correctly. Um, and then there's also endoscopy or colonoscopy. So um, endoscopy that go in the front or colonoscopy that go in through the back, um, looking at their GI system. And they can also perform a biopsy while they're in there if they choose to. But they don't always do a biopsy when they do these. Um, now, stool specimen. Stool specimen, when we do a culture for these, there's not really like a cleaning method or anything like that, like with um, urine. So a culture just needs to be in a sterile specimen. Um, usually, of course, they're not going to go into the sterile specimen cup they're going to go into a container and then you spoon it out or you get a um, tongue depressor or some popsicle stick kind of thing and scoop a piece 
into the sterile specimen. And there's your culture that you send off to the lab. Um, another type of test that we can run on the stool is a fecal blood. Um, this can be done without sending it to lab. Um, we're actually, we do with a gloved hand um, in a little bit of um, lubricant, not much because you don't want to skew the test, but a little bit to make it more comfortable for the patient. Insert the finger um, into the rectum and try to pull out a piece of stool. Um, the piece of stool then gets wiped onto a, um, a little sheet of paper that is um, then folded over and what's it called? You have a container that's yellow, I'm drawing a blank, and you drop your little drops on it um, and the sheet of paper will turn blue if there's any presence of blood on um, in the, the stool. Um, so blue is a positive result for blood. That's what that means. Okay, so um, interventions. Um, so primary and secondary. So primary, we're going to encourage the use of the bedside commode and bedpan. Of course, prevent skin breakdown, promote exercise, diet, and hydration. Secondary, um, we're going to do those preventative screening. So occult blood testing. So that I just talked about with taking that specimen and looking for any blood in the stool um, is actually recommended beginning at the age of 50. Um, to, to be done annually. A sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy is recommended every five to ten years beginning at age 50 and then um, both of those earlier if the um, client has a family history of colorectal cancer. Medications, um, we can give antidiarrheal medications to kind of um, firm up that stool and make it less loose. We can also give a laxative to make it more loose. Um, stool softeners to um, make it easier for a harder stool to pass. Um, and then, of course, enemas. So, in your used book, um, table 40 2 on page 60, there's a table that talks about different types of enemas and what they are used for. So please take a look at these. So there's um, hypertonic and isotonic enemas, there's oil enemas, medication enemas, carminative enemas, and return flow enemas. Um, these all have different amounts, um, how long that they need to sit, and as well as um, the purpose for each one of these enemas. So please take a look at these um, and know the indication for different kinds because they are our, um, different in me. Procedures, um, we can um, insert a nasogastric tube, so an NG tube. Uh, this can be used for decompression of the GI tract, um, administration of medications or feeding. So if there's an issue of the upper GI, we can bypass it with the tube. Or um, compression of internal hemorrhage, um, so we can Form suction to um, remove the blood from the abdomen, uh, from the stomach, or perform a gastric lavage, so emptying the stomach contents of whatever it was in there. So, diversions of the bowel, um, we can do this for um, rectal prolapse, we can repair rectal prolapse. We can um, perform a hemorrhoidectomy. Um, so that's fixing and getting, clipping, getting rid of the hemorrhoids. Um, there are fecal collection systems, so the fecal management systems. Um, so that's an insertion of a tube, kind of like a urinary catheter tube, but it goes into the rectum. You inflate slightly a balloon um, to keep it in place, and it collects liquid stool. Um, of course, once the client's stool become hard again, it's not really going to be easily pushed into this tube. So once the client is no longer having liquid stools, um, FMS is no longer um, indicated. A colonoscopy and ileostomy. So I would 
be very familiar with these. So where the um, portion of the colon or large intestine is removed and the end of that portion is brought to the abdominal wall. And so they're gonna have a stoma and depending on where the um, colostomy was performed at in that portion of the bowel um, is gonna determine where it is in the abdomen and at what process it is still undergoing for um, absorption. And so each area may be different type of stool that you should be aware of. So if you have a sigmoid colonostomy, this is near the rectum, so it's gone through most of the process. And so those stool, you can expect to be mostly formed. Whereas at the beginning of um, the absorption process, if they have a secostomy or an ascending colonostomy, then that's at the beginning of the process. So this is all still fairly wet and has a lot of um, gastric juices and enzymes, so those digestive enzymes. And so they can be very irritating to the skin. Um, a loop colonostomy um, is a large bridge. So they might have two sites um, right in the middle, kind of where that transverse colostomy is, um, putting those two parts together, but also being outside of the abdomen. It can be very difficult to manage is the main thing you need to know about that one. Um, ileostomy is when it's um, done to the small intestine. So those, that one is not pictured, but again, small intestine is prior to the process of the large intestine. And so even more so, it's gonna be more irritating to the skin around the site, around the stoma, um, because of those digestive enzymes. So really need to be um, mindful and know um, these types of ostomies and what to expect out of the stool and um, problems that could occur because of the placement and where you would expect the placement of these colostomies and ileostomies to be at in their abdomen, like the right lower quadrant or the left lower quadrant. Okay. Now, these other things I think are kind of interesting. For ileostomies, there's an ilioanal pouch. So this is where they um, divert from the small intestine straight into, um, uh, so they skip the large intestines and create a pouch um, near the anal canal um, or into the anus directly itself um, so that the anus has the sphincter still under control by the client. So of course they're gonna be expecting to have liquid stools, but um, it is all internal and controlled by the client. Um, instead of having a stoma or a colostomy bag or ostomy bag that they have to manage. Um, a Coke pouch is um, also uh, similar to the ileoanal, but it is creating a pouch inside of the abdomen um, with a small hole that can be, uh, in, a catheter can be inserted kind of like a super pubic catheter um, to drain that stool um, from the abdomen. And so those are two interesting types of ileostomies that I think you should know. All right, ostomy care. So this is when that intestine is brought to the abdominal wall. So we need to protect the skin, we need to collect the drainage, and we need to control the odor. There's a skill in your use book, pages 1066 to 1070, that you should be familiar with. So these are the three main things that we're looking at um, and trying to control um, when we are performing ostomy care. So um, when you're going through that skill and reading through it, take notice of these three things. So we're going to protect the skin from that breakdown. So we're going to provide a skin barrier or a wafer in between so that it's absorbing some of that moisture and gastric enzymes and becoming irritating to the skin. So this um, is usually cut 
to the appropriate size. And so size and proper placement is very important so that as little as possible, because it's not always possible to eliminate, but as little as possible to have that um, stool um, coming in contact with the skin is the main goal. So it doesn't um, begin that skin breakdown. Now the next goal is to collect the drainage, of course. So we're going to apply a pouch um, to the stoma um, around that wafer or um, barrier device that um, will collect the drainage. Um, it will come out on its own. It's not like a movement. Uh, there's no sphincter control. It just happens on its own um, through the uh, process of the GI system, um, which means that gas, as the patient may have gas, um, they may need to be aware of the foods that they eat and the more gas that they may have because that bag can fill up with just air, gas. And so in those cases, we um, may need to burp the bag, the ostomy, colectomy, collecting bag. Um, so that means that you're expelling the, the gas, um, but it may not need to be emptied because it's not actually full of stool, it is full of gas. And so that is when we burp it. Um, now the next issue is controlling odor. So um, most of the content should be contained in the pouch if it's applied appropriately um, and it's not leaking. Um, so the odor should be controlled um, in the pouch at all times until the pouch is um, opened. Um, and that should only happen when we open it to empty the amount. So it does not always open because then it's just going to drain out and of course be odorous because there's always stool around. So these, um, both of these um, urinary and bowel eliminations were found in three of your textbooks. This is a compilation of your get ins your use, and your ATI fundamentals books from these pages. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, I'll be available in Canvas as well for this class. Um, thank you, and goodbye.